The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we come to you right now, and I pray that your spirit would lead me as I deliver your word to your church. I pray that those who are here, that they would eliminate any distraction that may keep them from hearing this word and receiving it and having a personal encounter with you and your goodness and your love. Lord, I pray that this word would be heard and that it would be received and that it would be applied to their lives. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So for today's message, I wanted to talk to us about Christian unity. And I think this is a very important topic for us because in our world and especially in our country right now, we are very divided. There are a number of issues that are dividing not only the country, but also people in the church, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm sure there's some of you that maybe have posted about it. Maybe you are having these conversations offline with people, but I'm sure all of us have talked about some of these different topics at some uh, time or another. Should we wear masks? You know, what context? Are we giving up a right if we wear masks? If we don't wear masks, are we being inconsiderate of others? Um, what about the riots and the protests? How should we handle and discuss these? Who should we vote for in this upcoming election? There are so many different topics right now that there are so many people being divided on. But I want us to go to um, a text in Ephesians today. It's going to be Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And in this text, we're going to see how Christians are called to unity rather than how the world consistently is going to call us and tempt us to go and to divide and to get into debates and arguments with one another and how that is not the Spirit's leading. So once again, I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And it says this, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So this is the Apostle Paul here writing to the church at Ephesus, which you guys are familiar with from our seven-part series on the seven churches of Revelation. But in this letter, Paul wants to make it very clear that for Christians to be active and to be on point and to be intentional with their calling as Christians, they are called to walk in unity. And he gives some different things regarding unity in this text. But the first thing that I want to point us to is that we are called to unity. This is a calling for the Christian. So you cannot be a faithful Christian if you are rejecting unity. I do want to be clear, though, that unity does not mean conformity. You can see in certain churches and sometimes in church leadership, it can be tempting for us to try to make everyone be exactly like us in leadership. That's not what unity means in the church. See, as Christians, we all come from different walks of life. We have different backgrounds. We have different gifts. We have different um, of our um, teaching and education levels. We have uh, different social classes. There are so many different people that come from different walks of life. And God can intentionally use that. 
He can use our differences and he can make that actually a strength for the body. If you think of it like this, think of a baseball team or a football team. Notice how there are many different players on the team. There are many different positions on the team where people are gifted and they specialize in certain areas. But then imagine, what if these players didn't want to play the position that they were called to play? What if the quarterback calls a play and then the linemen decide, you know, we're not going to go for that play? You know, what if he's planning on going back to pass and then they do a run play blocking and he gets sacked, right? Not going to be very effective. What if the pitcher is throwing the ball and he decided he was going to do a curve, but the catcher says, you know what? I don't even feel like catching the ball right now. You know, I want to go out in the outfield. What if he decides, I'm going to be on the other team, I'm just going to bat, right? It just doesn't work. So we are called to unity, but not conformity. We are called to act as a football team or a baseball team in which we would have multiple different gifts, multiple different personalities. We would come together for a common purpose and a common mission. So that is what it means by calling us to unity, Likewise, when it comes to some of our theological concepts, there are many in this room that probably differ on certain things in Scripture. Now, we don't want to say we don't want to be biblical. We definitely want to affirm the teachings of Scripture. But there will be certain things that we differ on regarding how does everything play out in the end times? How do the spiritual gifts relate to now? many other different things in Scripture that are important and are good to have conversations on. But at the end of the day, there are people in this church and there are people in churches all across the world who differ on this issue. But they are still brothers and sisters in Christ. And you are still called to unity with those brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, with that being said, the Apostle Paul says this. He calls us to unity in a specific way. He's calling us to commit to love and serve one another. And he does it by giving us three words in this text. He uses lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering. And I want to take each one of these words real quick at a time. So whatever he's calling us to unity, and he's calling us to be acting in a lowly fashion, he's calling us to humility here. He's calling us to selflessness. What he's saying is this. When you are a part of a church body, a church family, your focus should not be primarily on yourself. See, this can be very hard. Because we live in such a, you know, culture in which a way you're always planning your next step on what am I doing with my job? What am I doing for my house? What am I doing for all my payments, my bills? We're so inwardly focused all the time. And then when we come into the church building, sometimes we can be tempted to think, what is the church going to do for me? Specifically. Rather than how can I serve those that I'm fellowshipping with? Likewise, sometimes when we come into the church, we're more concerned with whether or not it entertained us or if we liked the music or if we like a certain thing. And we have to remember it's not solely about our personal preference. It's about the whole church family. So are you someone who is being lowly? Are you someone who is showing and displaying humility and selflessness and saying, whatever we do, I want to do it in such a way that I'm serving and loving my brothers and sisters in the church. Even if it's something that maybe I wouldn't personally vote on when it comes to a certain preference. Do you remember when you come to church it's not just about you and God. 
There's that tendency so, so much in churches now as I'm coming to have a personal experience with God, which is a good thing, but we forget that we're worshiping with a body. See, if you're just you and God, then why are you coming to church? If you just want to worship with God, you can do that in your car going to work. You can sing a song of praise, and I'm, many of you probably do that. You can pray a prayer. You can have devotionals. But that's not being a part of the church. Church is living in a group of people who are diverse, but being unified in that body. So we're called to be selfless. We're called to think of the group over ourselves. And here's the thing. If every single one of us are thinking of everybody else, then you don't have to worry about yourself because you got all these other people in the room worrying about you. So that's why we are called to lowliness. Likewise, we are called to gentleness. Gentleness does not mean weakness. Gentleness means you are called to overly be kind and to have self-control. Are you someone who is kind and trying to be very delicate and intentional with the way that you handle things, with your words and your actions? Are you that person that always flies off the handle, always has to let people know what you think, how you think it, then and there? See, we're called to gentleness. Now, there might be that question, well, but truth is so important. We have to make sure that we are teaching and preaching truth. And I completely agree with that statement. However, truth must be shared with purpose. Truth must be shared in an accurate context. And I would say that context is this. When you are offering truth, you do it for the purpose of unifying the brothers and sisters in Christ. See, here's the thing. If you hang out with some imperfect people for a while, you'll notice there's a lot of things that they have issues with. You'll realize that all of us struggle in multiple different areas of our lives. So if you just thought every single time someone errs, I need to hit them over the head with a hammer every single time, guess what? You're not going to see very good unity. You're going to have no friends, is what that's going to look like. You have to Find the proper time and the proper, con proper context to share truth and do it because you desire unity. So you're sharing truth because you want to unify, not divide. Our goal should be to unite with one another. Then we see that he says long-suffering. Long-suffering refers to our patience. And God uses this term throughout Scripture to describe Himself and how He is long-suffering for us, desiring that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Are you somebody who is patient? Are you patient with your brothers and your sisters in Christ? If they do something that hurts you, wrongs you, offends you? Are you patient with them? Are you someone that always is thinking, how can I, even though they did wrong me, how can I find the best way to reconcile with my brothers and sisters? Are you always asking the question of how can I unite? How can we be unified despite our differences? Is that the question you're asking? Because I think we can be tempted to do the opposite of these three words. Lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering. I think many of us can be tempted to go to be prideful, to be rude, to be harsh, to gossip, to be impulsive, to be wrathful. But James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I think this is important for all of us and how we handle our relationships, and not even in the church, but all relationships. Are you the person 
who is taking that time to collect your thoughts, collect your feelings, collect your emotions, and then after you fully hear, fully understand, then you choose to speak and choose to act. A church will unite when the members are acting in this way. When we take the time to hear one another's concerns, hear one another's thoughts, and we might not always agree, but whenever you're heard, you're understood, you're respected, and then you respond, you'll see a united body. And we see that in this text of Ephesians chapter 4, how it calls us, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity. Endeavoring, striving, who is passionate about unity to walk worthy of our calling. Are you someone who is passionate about keeping this body united? Are you someone that hears everything in the news, sees everything on social media, and just continues to go that way? Are you the person that constantly says, how can I keep the church together? How can I keep us focused on Christ? Focused on the gospel? Focused on the mission? Which, which avenue do you go down? Division or unity? Because division is not an option for the church. So I think all of us need to ask that question. Would you be described by your brothers and sisters as someone who's a unifier or a divider? So we're called to walk in unity because unity cultivates peace. Verse 3 says, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. See, to be in unity with one another is to be yielding and trusting in and submitting to the Spirit of God. And when we do that, the result is the bond of peace. As we continue to unify, we continue to cultivate peace in our church body. And we know that division is not of God because Matthew 12, 25 says, but Jesus knew their hearts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. See, division is not of God. But when we choose to unite, when we are unified, we're strong. Think about this. If you're going to the gym and you're going to work out, and you have all your faculties, you have your arms, your legs, your core, everything. Now imagine if you go to work out and you start to eliminate parts of the body. And you say, I'm going to do leg day today, but I'm only going to use my left leg. Or I'm going to do um, some type of um, box jumps and I'm going to close my eyes. See, it doesn't work very well when the body isn't fully working together. The workout won't be very effective. You won't be very strong. That's what it's like for the church. Or think about in your home life. How effective do you think your parenting will be if you and your spouse are always arguing or fighting? Do you think your kids will know what to do if the parents are always disagreeing? How healthy do you think that relationship will be with you and your spouse if you guys are always fighting, always divided on a number of issues? See, you can't be divided and be strong. But when we're united, we can be strong. We can do what we're called to do. Because the devil, he doesn't fear a big church. Sometimes we can get really tempted to thinking the big churches are the ones that the devil is really concerned with. The devil does not fear a big church. He fears a united church. And that's why he loves division so much. 
And that's why you've heard this phrase, divide and conquer. That's what the adversary is wanting to do with us. He wants you to start to look at your brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants you to think about all the ways that you guys differ on different things. He wants you to be passionate about the division, not on the unity. He wants you to think about all the times that someone did something wrong to you and not any of the good. See, the enemy continues to want to divide us because he knows that will make us weak. And when we are weak, that leads to a number of issues in the church. And ultimately, it leads to no longer having peace in the church. Do you have concern for peace in the church? Do you want your brothers and sisters to come here to feel safe, to feel loved, cared for, encouraged, equipped? You do that in a place of peace. And that comes from a place of unity. But likewise, when it comes to our our communities, when it comes to our homes, when it comes to the world, peace starts with the church. And we have so many people, just turn on your TVs, get on your phones, people are crying out for peace right now. We've sang the song, Peace Be Still, multiple times recently during this pandemic. Everyone wants peace. They don't want all of this hatred and all this division to continue. They want peace. But it starts with the church. When we can unite together, when we can serve one another in the way that the Apostle Paul has described here, when we look towards one another before we look towards ourselves, it cultivates peace. When this church is a place of peace, it becomes very attractive. It becomes a lighthouse for those who are living in the dark. And that's what will affect your homes, your marriages, your children, the community, and the world. When the church unites and makes peace, that will lead to a peaceful world. But we have to remember, this is more than a moment. See, it's very easy to hear a message on unity and hear the concept of peace is a good thing and we like that concept until we go out and the first person, brother or sister in Christ, does something that ticks us off. And then we immediately want to go back to dividing. So this, to be effective, to work, for the Lord to bless the church, This has to be more than a moment. This has to be something that we all are committed and resolved to. This is something that we have to always keep that passion, that reminder of everything we do with our words and our actions is seeking to be unified. And when we do that, as I said, it cultivates that peace that we all desire in this world. And then the third and final thing that we see in this text is that God's oneness defines our oneness. In the text here, we see that there are seven elements listed of Christian unity. It says, it says there is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. And this is how we are to understand our Christian unity. See, we are all one body. That is the body of Christ. When we came to Christ, we became a part of this big family. And this is possible because of that one Spirit, the Holy Spirit who came. He transformed our hearts. He made us new, as Bill talked about earlier. He transformed us so that we could become a part of this body as we became born again. 
And this is why we have that one hope. Because of what Christ did as our one Lord. So now we are a part of the one faith which is in that Lord who died on the cross for our sins. And when we went then to and through our one baptism, we demonstrated our obedience and we recognized ourselves with the Lord on that cross. We recognized Him as our representative. And we give all thanks and all glory and all praise to the one God and Father of all who made this possible. When we look at these elements of Christian unity, it reminds us why we come here every week to worship. It reminds us the basis for why and how we can be unified together. Because when you think of it this way, when you think we come here because we're one body. When we come here and we think we are all, if you are a believer in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. We are all the temple of God. When we think that Jesus Christ saved each and every one of us, He came and found us as sinners. And He saved us. When we realize that we have that hope in Him. When we realize that when we come to this point of baptism, that that is to represent what He did for us when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, proving everything he did for us was true. And then when we think that there's this God who desired us, loved us, and made this sacrifice on our behalf, this is what will unite us. All of us, if you are a brother or sister in Christ, all of these things we are united in. We share this together. And that is why we come here to worship. Not because of all the division, not because of all the things that are going on in current events right now. We come together because of this. And this is what we need to get straight. And this is what needs to be the essentials. The most important above all is the Gospel, is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to focus on that first. And that is what we need to remember and unite around. But I also find it interesting that when we look at the seven elements of Christian unity here, we see the Trinity is defined. We see the one Spirit, the one Lord, and the one God and Father of all. See, the Trinity is three persons in one being. Three individuals who are lovingly glorifying, serving, and are united together. That's what the Trinity is. And we see it here in the context of Christian unity. And what this reminds me is this, is that our relationships with one another should reflect the triune God's relationship within Himself. Do you treat one another as God the Father treats His Son? Do you respect your elders like Christ respected His Father? That's how we are supposed to hold one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. High esteem to serve, love one another, to be unified in our purpose, our mission. That's what Jesus was praying in His high priestly prayer for His disciples. That we would be one as He and His Father are one. So this reminds us once again that God is our unifier. Not our skin color. Not our gender. Not our political party. Not our social status. Our position on current events. Not even our denomination. That does not unite us. God is the one who unites us. And Christ made unity possible on the cross. See, the gospel, as we know, we were all sinners. We had all fallen short of the glory of God. 
Christ came, he died on the cross for us, paying our moral fine so that we could be reconciled with God. But not only did he make it possible for us to reconcile with God, but he made it possible for us to reconcile with one another. The gospel makes it possible for us to truly love unconditionally one another. To be transformed by that Holy Spirit and to have a new heart for not only God, but also for each other. That's what the gospel is about. Reconciling man with God and his creation. So we need to rejoice, we need to celebrate because of the gospel, because of Christ, what he did for us. We can have Christian unity. And as we center ourselves in Christ, we center ourselves on the gospel, and we remember the essentials, and then we go out and we live lowly lives, gentle lives, and we be long-suffering with one another, we can cultivate that peace that comes from the powerful gospel message. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time to share your word. I thank you for this call to unity to reflect the relationship that you have with your Son and your Spirit. I pray that we would humble ourselves, that we would serve one another, look to serving and helping those before ourselves, Lord that we would be patient as you are patient with us, and that we would ultimately remember that we come to worship you, and it's all possible because your gospel message, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all that you do and all that you continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.